morning, good morning, good morning in the Maple Avenue this morning here at the congregation. We are so grateful to be in God's place. Good morning, all of you that are watching from home that just couldn't get out of your cozy beds, but you decided to give your attention to uh, God this morning. And so we are forever grateful for you at home. And it's just so good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. This morning. So let's just welcome God into this place. Can we do that? And feel free to stand or you don't may not know the words or maybe we do. You do know the words are on the screen. So we just want to just welcome the Holy Spirit into this place. This is why we're here to be able to love each other and to be in this place with God's people. And I'm just so forever grateful that you would allow me to be able to worship with you today. So. Holy Spirit, we thank you, God. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Holy God. God, remove everything that we brought in, Lord, that, that stands in front of you, God. God, block every negative thought, block, God, that just doesn't allow for us to flourish as a person, as a church, as a body. Lord, we have work to do, and we know that you have ordained us to do it. And God, you trusted us, and we thank you for that. Well, we ask that your Holy Spirit come in this place right now, God, and fill this place, God. Jesus. Jesus. Welcome into this place. Welcome to this broken vessel you desire to abide in the presence of your people so we lift our hands
Thank you, God. The Holy Spirit is not in this place. Give God some praise this morning. Then I don't know what else is. God, we love you. We thank you. Let's do the call to worship. Amen. In this place, in churches throughout the land, and in heaven above, praises are sung. Let's hear these words from Revelation as John takes a peek into heaven and sees what's going on. All praise to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us his kingdom and his priests who serve before God his Father. Give to him everlasting glory. He rules forever and ever. Amen. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the nations of the earth will weep because of him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, and who, um, and who is to come the Almighty God. Let's give him our praise. Glory to God. As we offer up, yes, this praise unto your name. As we offer up from this broken vessel the praise unto your name. Amen, amen. The Lord is high above the heavens. What do you know about God being above the heavens on this earth? But well, we want to give God some praise this morning for that. Are you ready? Give God some praise this morning. We've come a long way. And I don't think you understand because I don't hear you this morning. Give God some praise. Amen. I couldn't be standing here today. She couldn't be standing here today without God's glory. Let's give it to him. Lord, it's hot. Give up. Hey. This is a call and response. Let me hear you. Acknowledging him always, and all the people say, Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Acknowledging him always, and all the people say, Halle, Halle, Hallelujah! Halle, Halle, Hallelujah! Halle, Halle, Hallelujah! Halle, Halle, Halle! Oh, the Lord is high above the heavens, and there's glory above the nations. Knowledge is for the acknowledging him always, and all the people say, Halle, Halle, Hallelujah! Halle, Halle, Hallelujah! Let me hear you! Halle, Halle, Hallelujah! Halle, Halle, Hallelujah! Oh, the Lord is high above the heavens, and his glory above the nations. Both 
the nations. Give God the highest praise, acknowledging Him always. And all the people say, Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Halle, Hallelujah. Halle, Hallelujah. Halle, Hallelujah. Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Let me hear you. Oh, yes, God. Halle, halle, halle. One more time. Halle, halle. The Lord is high above the heavens. The Lord is high above the heavens. And his glory above the nation. And his glory above the nation. The Lord is high above the heaven. And his glory above the nation. And his glory above the nation. Give God the highest praise, acknowledging him always. And all the people say, Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Give, give. Give God the highest praise, acknowledging Him always. And all the people say, Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Listen to me, repeat after me. The Lord is high above the heavens, and His glory above the nation. Give God the highest praise, acknowledging Him always. And all the people say, Halle, Halle, Hallelujah! Halle, Halle, Hallelujah! Halle, Halle, Hallelujah! One more time, Hallelujah! Halle, Halle, Hallelujah! Amen, amen. I got you up. Hallelujah. 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 Come on. Hallelujah. Oh, the Lord is high above the heavens. The Lord is high above the heavens. And this glory above the nation. Give God the highest praise, acknowledging Him always. And all the people say, Halle, 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 Hallelujah. Yeah. Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Give God some praise this morning. Don't stop the praise. Give God some praise. We got a lot to be thankful for this morning. God is so good. Yes, he is. And in a place where we feel where there is no hope, no future, or what, God, what do you have for me? And then with everything that we continuously to see on the news we turn the TV on and there is nothing good to watch death after death after death after death and then when the body begins to feel hopeless that's when we have to call on the Lord that's when we have to remind ourselves what is our hope built on what foundation do we stand on because we believe if we believe what we believe then no one else could break that foundation. We have something to sustain. We have something to hope for. There are people, can you imagine, that have nothing? So when we sing the words, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood, is, some people don't even know that. But because we do, and because we believe, let us go into the world and confess that. Let us live that. Let us be that. And when we feel hopeless... We just be reminded of the people that we have around us, the body, the things that God says. His word is, is just true. It, it goes nowhere. It's solid. On Christ, a solid rock I stand. I believe that with every molecule and cell and everything in my body, 
because I have nothing else. I have nothing left but God. Let's go to God. You know the song, lift the words. God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, today. My hope. Listen. My hope is built, yes, on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. But what do we trust? But holy trust in Jesus' name. Let's say that again, saints. My hope. My hope is built on nothing less. Then Jesus' blood and righteousness, I did not trust. Dare not trust. Yes, the sweetest rain. What am I gonna do? But holy trust in Jesus' name. All over the building, let's sing with one voice. Oh. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the sure if our words match that's okay we'll keep doing it my hope is built on nothing less sing my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust I dare not trust the sweetest rain, but holy trust in Jesus' name. We stand on Christ alone. We stand in Christ alone. Savior's love through the storm. He is the Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone. Christ alone. Cornerstone, we made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is the Lord, He's Lord of all. So God, you are Lord of all. Even in our trials and tribulations, God, even when our money is low and our decisions that we make, God, or we feel that they are not of you, God. God, you're in it. God, be with us everywhere we go. In our minds, in our car, in a shower, at our jobs. God, be with us. We need you. In Christ alone, we stand on the solid rock, God. We have nothing else. 
So God, on this day and every day, every minute, every hour, God, show up, continue to give us signs, continue to give us sweet smells, God, that allow that your presence is here with us, God. God, be with those who are in this time who are grieving and can't get past happiness, God, can't reach anything, God, because of the grief, God. We know you're in that too, God. Transformation is everywhere. And God, we trust it in this church. We trust it in our lives, God. And we trust it in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Holy God, we thank you. Amen. You may be seated. In Matthew, we read, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. Knowing that we... Our, we fall so short of being able to love our neighbor. And so many times our vision is obscured from being able to see how to love God even. And in the midst of that, there's also ourselves. But we are called to love ourselves, our neighbors, and God. Where we fail to make that mark let's let's um, bear our souls before God and admit where we've failed to love in a silent prayer of confession We have not been left alone. We have not been left to suffer for all of our sins. That was Christ's place. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. In the peace of Christ, let's greet one another and pass that piece along.
testing one, two. Maple Avenue, we can go a long time. <laughs> if you haven't visited us before, maybe the last time, we, this is our meet and greet. We like to go a long time during this time, but we don't see each other as much and we're always happy to, to embrace one another, but we definitely want to um, keep the worship going in our hearts and also through the congregation. Yesterday, I don't know if you guys, um, I'm, I'm sure we've talked about Cindy, Cindy, Cindy Putnam, um, she was a longtime member of Maple Avenue and also part of our choir, um, an amazing person and just an amazing worshiper and her and her husband John and their family had attended here at some point and so we sent her on yesterday and uh, this was a selection, uh, My Life is in Your Hands by her family that they wanted to hear and um, uh, talking to our, our, our guest pastor, well, he, <laughs> uh, um, he was you know he's going to lead us into the hopelessness and in, in our world and where we are today and I just thought this is such a beautiful song to be reminded of and as I stood on this stage as a teenager and didn't know what I was singing but as an adult I thought wow God I was singing that and now that I'm so you know at a different place in my life and in my faith I'm just so grateful for what this song has to offer um and the reminding of that our life truly is not our own. And Cindy knew that. And when she sang this song, we talked about how her hands were wide and her head was back and she was smiling. And that is, was the Cindy, the signature Cindy Putnam praise. And I love that because she didn't care who was around her. She wasn't trying to look pretty or trying to be perfect or trying to identify what worship was. She knew my hands are raised, my head is lifted. And I, and my life is not my own. And so you may stay seated, but um, I, I, I offer you to, to listen to your, with your hearts and to sing um, with your hearts as well. You don't have to worry. And don't you be afraid. Joy. Joy comes in the morning. Yes, it does. Troubles, they don't last always. For there's a friend in Jesus who will wipe your tears away. And if your heart is broken, just lift your hands, just lift your hands and say, oh, I know that I can make it. I know that I can stand. No may come my way Jesus my life is in your hands let's do that one more time listen to the words you don't have to worry and don't you be afraid 
Joy comes in the morning. Troubles, they don't last always. For there's a friend, for there's a friend in Jesus who will wipe your tears away. And if your heart is broken, just lift your hands and say, Oh, I know that I can make it. I know that I can stand. Because your life, your life, yes. So listen, so when your tests and trials, the things that get you down, they seem to get you down. And all your friends and loved ones, we know what that's like, are nowhere to be found. Remember there's a friend for there's a friend in Jesus. Remember, he calls you friend who will wipe your tears away. And if your heart is broken, I'm going to lift my hands. Yes, saints, let's sing all over the building. Oh, I know that I Children would like to come up. Come on up, kids. I don't bite hard. That was not uh, getting get the laugh there. That was I didn't get the laugh there. That I don't bite. <laughs> if um, you don't have everyone one of these in your bulletin. We can bring you one. Do you guys have one of these? You guys want to take one of these? Um, there should be some back there. These will be for uh, the teaching after, later, but we're going to do a little bit with the kids here. Thank you, Vanika. Those were two songs I used to sing in gospel choir when I was in college. Does anybody else need one of these out there? Does everybody have one? Chris uh, over here. See that? And uh, the hope would be to have uh, pens for especially the adults. Do you guys need one? Here you go. Here you go. And um, the idea is that kids, you can uh, enjoy the, the labyrinth or the maze later. So tell me, um, school is coming up soon. Has anybody started school already? You started school? <laughs> Has anybody here started school yet? Who's going to school in the fall? Hands up high if you're going to school in the fall. All right, who's, who's really excited? I can't wait 
to go to school in the fall. Okay, all right, so that's one, two, three. Who is, who is not really excited about going back to school? So why wouldn't you guys want to go back to school? What's, what's wrong with school? Tests? Tests? <laughs> Shepard? What's that? He likes being with his family. What, what else? With, he likes being with me. I like being with you, too. What else would be trouble about going back to school? Is there other things that you're maybe a little nervous about? Is anybody going to have a new teacher? Brand new teacher? You've never, never seen that teacher before? Is anybody going to have to meet, like, new friends? New friends? Are you going to be learning things that you've never had to learn before? All right. Hey, did anybody um, have a parent that signed you up for something that you're not really sure about? Yeah, hands up, hands up high. Yeah, you too, Merritt. You're not really sure about. So sometimes going back to school can have lots of confusion and challenges even though we're excited to meet our new, new teachers and our new friends. So if you see on your, your papers there, you can see there's two circles there. And those are different ways of thinking about how sometimes life can be not what we thought it would be. And so on one side, you'll see a maze, and one side, you'll see a labyrinth. Can anybody tell me the difference between a maze and a labyrinth? Some of you besides my boys. You're top of the class. Yes, you are. Can you guys tell? Anybody look at the maze and the labyrinth? Can you tell what the difference is? What do you think? This one you just get to the middle, but this one you get to here. This one you just get to here. One get takes you to the middle, and one doesn't, Shepard. Well, in the labyrinth, you can see through the whole entire circle. Uh-huh. So the labyrinth takes you through everything, yeah? Uh huh. Anybody else? What's the difference between a maze and what do you? Um, the lines are more like Oh, there's something more graceful about a labyrinth. Does anybody know what a labyrinth is? Has anybody been to a labyrinth before? What's a labyrinth, Sheppy? Oh, and at a zoo. Yeah. Parents, do you know what a labyrinth is? Anybody know what a labyrinth is? Where minotaurs What's that? Where minotaurs live. Where minotaurs live, yeah. Um, <laughs> is that in the line of which in a wardrobe somewhere? No. no, no. <clears throat> um, so a labyrinth, what you see there is from a cathedral. I think you pronounce it Chartres in France. And it's a, a, a mirror of what can happen in life. So if you notice, you guys want to put your finger on the entryway into the labyrinth and just start following the line inside. See how it kind of meanders? And as you follow, even parents, if you're looking at it, as you follow it, you think you kind of know where it's taking you. Oh, I kind of have a sense of what this is. But then, whoops, it turns, it turns. So this is kind of like what life can be like, even when you go back to school in the fall, where you think you know what you're doing, and then something will surprise you. And the main difference between a labyrinth and a maze is that a maze is there to trick you. A maze is there to trap you. There's ways to make mistakes in a maze. But you can't make a mistake in a labyrinth. If you just keep following the path on a labyrinth, even if it seems strange and circuitous, and you'll eventually get to the center. So when we think about a labyrinth as Christians, what do you think is in the center? What do we find in the center? Somebody besides my, my kids. What do you think? All right, Shepard, you can tell us. What's, what would we find in the center? Happiness and peace. What else could we find in the center of a, as we move? If we, if we understand that life is taking us in strange turns. Want to try again? <laughs> Heaven. Yeah. Yeah. So we would, we would think about this as, as finding our center in God. Finding our center in Jesus. 
So it seems strange, but not only is Jesus in the center, but he's with us all the way along. So I wanted to give you guys something that you could also work on. And if you don't want to draw on the labyrinth, you could just take your finger and follow the labyrinth with your finger and move all the way to the center. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, would you be our center? As we just sang, our life is in your hands. We know that we can make it. We might not know what this fall looks like for our classrooms, with our new teachers, with all the things that we're going to do. But please, Jesus, be with all of us, especially these young ones, as they finish their summer and prepare for a fall of learning to trust you in the center of their heart. Amen. All right, thanks, guys. You can be seated. It's time for our announcements. Um, as Vanika had mentioned, um, we lost a sister, Cindy Putnam, um, and um, just want to be mindful of John and uh, the Putnam family, the extended family. Um, pray for them as they come to grips with reality as it stands now and in their grief, and also um, to be keeping in mind uh, Betty Anker as they wait. They wait upon the Lord. Please keep them in your prayers as well. Today we're not going to be doing the congregational prayer um, before the sermon. Um, after the giving, after the word, uh, we will spend some time together in prayer. Um, as far as other announcements go, um, in two weeks, we have Lisa Sharon Harper, um, a well, an author, but well known for her work in the area of justice, and um, she'll be she'll be here in two weeks. And I hope that uh, everyone can attend and give her a warm welcome. Um, we also will be having the well, and Josh, Josh will probably be sort of touching on this with the. Christians and human sexuality conversations that are going to be coming up. Um, just keep looking in the bulletin for where we're at with that and where when it will begin. Um, also, the youth group, where is Jack? Okay. Jack has an announcement for the youth group. By the way, out of all the, everybody, all the young kids, whatever, young kids, growing adolescents, Who's been doing some of the activities? Can you raise your hand if you've been to? Okay. Saw a spike ball. Just curious. <laughs> Hello, Maple Ave. Um, if we haven't met, my name is Jack, Jack Wallace. Um, I'm a Hope College student, going to be a senior. Um, and I help out with the youth group here at Maple Ave, um, helping to start it up and kick it off a little bit. Um, me along with a bunch of other um, parents and just members of the church. Um, so just wanted to make the events aware. They are in the bulletin, so keep this with you when you leave today. Um, today, we're actually going on a hike at Saugatuck, Saugatuck Dune State Park. Um, if you need a ride, you can meet here at 2 p.m. If you don't, you can meet at the Dunes at 2.30. Um, and you can pick up from the Dunes if you have to drop a kid off at 4.30 or from the church at 5 p.m. That's all in the bulletin. You don't have to remember that. Um, Thursday, this upcoming Thursday, um, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., we will be doing games and a scavenger hunt at the church. Um, there's going to be a special prize announced at the end, so make sure you come to that. Um, and then next Sunday, there's not going to be an event because the youth leadership team will be having a meeting. But um, typically, every, there will be an event every Sunday um, at some point after church, and it's usually in the bulletin, so... Make sure you keep that with you. And Thursdays as well. Um, we try and do an event Thursday nights. Um, please, RSVP, RSVP, if you need a ride. Um, JT's number is in the bulletin. Um, but yeah, 
And this like youth group is targeted towards pretty much any age that is like under 20. Um, you can be in high school, you can be in elementary school, you can be in middle school. Um, <laughs> and if you are older than 20 and still want to come, we would love to have you as well. Um, but yes, any kids of any age are welcome to come. Um, Vanika said something today, I don't know if I'm taking this out of context, but she said, like, she was up here singing when she was a teenager and, like, didn't really understand the words. That's kind of the point of the youth group, is, like, when you're a kid, it's kind of hard to understand these things. Um, there's, there's not really a reason we go to church, your parents just make you go. Um, but with this youth group, hopefully you can meet some other people your age, and we can ask the questions, and we can grow closer and um, just be there for one another. Um, obviously, it's kind of hard to talk to your parents about some things, and that's where the youth group can come kind of come in um, and answer some of those questions. So feel free to ask questions to me or JT or any of the other youth group leaders. Um, we'd love to talk to you about it. So, yeah. Thanks, Jack. Um, also, uh, Mac Rec is meeting for the last time this uh, coming Wednesday, and it's also the Back to School Bash. Um, I don't know exactly all that is planned, but there's goodies. So um, <laughs> come on out uh, Wednesday between 4 and 7 and uh, get geared up for, for um, school. And then next uh, Sunday, um, we'll also be doing the, well, the blessing of the backpacks, the blessing upon the children as they go into the, the next school year. Um, and it also happens to be a potluck, a mammalie meal uh, Sunday. So there's a sign up in the back um, to write down what dishes you might bring so that we might not all bring chocolate cake. Um, but don't forget chocolate cake. That's, <laughs> okay, let's, t let's go to God in prayer as we um, consider what he's given to us. Lord, thank you so much for the, all that you have supplied to us. You have um, given us many gifts and talents, but you've also provided for us with, with financially. And Lord, we take this time now to offer back to you that which you have already given to us so that your ministry here out of Maple Avenue Ministries and in partnership with so many other ministries, we ask that they will be strengthened and be able to move forward so that your word may spread. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. We've been blessing the Lord from the time that we walked through the door and I hope in Jesus' name that you're blessing the Lord every day. But uh, we decided to do this hymn because I, I, I really, we love it and it's just, Eric is just, just, can you just give a round of applause for Eric this morning? I am just so grateful. And Laura, who gets to, I get to hear a beautiful voice this morning. It's such a blessing and just to know that God does give us what we need. And you hear the daily manna, but he does give us what we need. And um, I'm just so grateful that the gifts and things that we have in this place. So can we bless the Lord? Would you bless the Lord with me this morning? Bless the Lord, oh my soul, yes, and all that is within me bless his holy name Yeah. 
please stand to your feet as we sing this last verse of bless the Lord. great things. He has done great things. He's given us life this morning. He has done great things. When the report says, yes, God, we say, he Praise God from all blessings from. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Thank you, thank you, worship leaders. It is a gift uh, to be with you this morning. For those that don't know me, my name is Josh Banner. My family's right here in the front, Susanna, Casper Shepherd, and I think Merritt took off. Um, everything I'd like to share with you this morning pivots around these circles got two more ideas I want to offer for your consideration. All of anything that I have to offer you comes back to these circles. So I'm going to approach this time of teaching more like a guided retreat. My vocation these days is uh, functioning as a spiritual director. So a uh, retreat leader, sitting with people, talking about how they talk about God, how they identify God, who God is, how they pray, how they do or don't open their hearts. And that's um, the best that I have to offer. And so I figured I'd offer this morning is more of a reflection. So if you don't have one of these pieces of paper and a pen, there's just going to be a few pauses where we'll have a chance to to offer some reflection. But when it comes to this, uh, beginning with this idea, labyrinth vis-a-vis -a, -vis a maze, the last three years have especially felt like a maze. And as I was sharing with the, the children, a maze is set up to trick you, to cause you to get lost to get confused and disoriented. And it's been very difficult for me 
to realize that my path towards Christ is already taken care of. It's already available. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, it was probably within the first quarter of the pandemic. And I think I shared this at another time when I was teaching on a Sunday. Someone had put somewhere on Facebook, somewhere on social media, this idea, let's not get back to normal. Because if we go back to normal, we will not have learned what this pandemic is here to teach us. So I offer that for your consideration as we start. If it's not a maze, it's a labyrinth, and there is something circuitous about the brokenness of our world where I think I know where I'm going, but then I get confused, and if I can trust God, I can actually make it around another curve safely moving towards my center in Christ. If I don't trust the Spirit in all this, then I do. My mind and my heart, all of my sensibilities start approaching my relationships, my body, my work, as if I'm in a maze. And I, it's so easy to get, get um, confused. And when I, when I approach my life like a maze, then yeah, I I end up traumatized. I end up full of all kinds of unnecessary pain. But again, that overarching idea, maybe there's something here that COVID-19 can teach us. That is an offensive idea to start with. (laughs) Especially to us as Westerners, as Americans, How many of you, you can bear witness in yourself, and looking around yourself, especially the marketing agencies, come on, excuse me, come on, get get back to it, come on, buy some stuff, fix your life, get back into a job, make some money, get out of bed, everything's okay, everything's okay, and there is a sense that we have to figure out in the midst of the maze, how to get a day done, how to keep attending to our obligations, our responsibilities, to do that with love. But then the problem is when we stop and pause to actually be quiet, we start to realize, oh man, there's some some dizziness going on here. There's some, something's bubbling up. I'm not doing as well as I thought it was. So that's the first idea. The maze vis-a-vis the labyrinth, that there is a path towards the center, and that if we are in Christ, we are being taken care of. The other one is um, in mind of thinking about this in terms of the human sexuality report that was introduced in the CRC. If you're not familiar with this, Maple Avenue has a dual denominational status, and if I get this wrong, and if an elder wants to clarify, from what I understand, we're we're CRC as well as RCA, so you might be here from the Reformed Church of America tradition, or you might be here from the CRC, or you might not care. (laughs) Um, But what that basically means is that the CRC part of our denominational affiliation has been working through some very difficult questions about what we believe as a, as a worshiping community, not just in this building, but across the country, the world, about same-sex attraction, church membership, ordination for church ministry. And so one of the big um, movements in that conversation was, was this human sexuality report. And it's a prickly pear. It's a hot potato. It's a hot topic. So what I wanted to do is to offer, this doesn't have to be a maze. We don't have to get lost in this conversation. Jesus is everywhere to be found 
And he cares more about this conversation than we can possibly begin to understand. So some vocabulary to help you maybe think about how the circles could serve us in our learning. Um, I'm so glad that Vanika did those last two songs in the first song. Um, Welcome into this place. I knew that those songs because I sang in a gospel choir when I was in college. And uh, I celebrate the gift that I have of singing in a black gospel choir. But just because I spent two years at Wheaton College singing in a black gospel choir doesn't mean that I know everything that there is to know about the history of Christianity through the black church. And I want to say that I had that presumption. And so whether it's racism, sexuality, we're going to have a a moment where we can pause and consider all the different hot button issues, whether they're on the um, news feed, daily news feed or not. How do we come with our presumptions? All right, so um, I'm going to go away from racism and sexuality. One of the hot button issues for me when I was um, 10 was Karate Kid versus Ghostbusters. All right, so my cousin came to visit our house. I lived outside of the D.C. area in McLean, Virginia at that time. The family, their family came to, to stay with us, and my cousin Chris was supposed to stay in our room, and I was all about Ghostbusters. He was all about Karate Kid. And the whole time that they were here, we, every time we had a chance, we were fighting, fighting, fighting. And we got so mad about this that I actually kicked him out of my room and said, you're not welcome to be in my room. So, um, so if I could, um, could I have um, a, an object model? Javier, do you mind standing over and pretending to be my cousin for me? Can you, can you stand up and... Be my cousin. So if you want to imagine that we have this large circle here, right? And if Javier is pretending to be my cousin, Chris, right? And we're on the outside of this circle thinking that Christ is at the center, right? And what we're doing is we're shouting at each other across these things. We're enraged because we're in the maze. We're thinking this is all a maze. We're reacting to each other. But if we decide and we we get it into our heart and mind that this is a labyrinth and we understand that Christ is in the center, so we're moving towards the center. You know, you're moving towards the center. So Christ is in the center, right? So what is happening? Even though he likes Karate Kid and I like Ghostbusters, if we're moving towards the center by proxy, by, by circumstance, we're actually moving closer to each other, right? And we get to eventually realize as we move closer to Christ that all that we're reacting to is not as important as being together here in the center. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Can I have some water? So I had that um, illustration offered to me when I was in campus ministries at Hope College, there was a group of really, really brave black Hope, Hope College students that wanted to sit down with campus ministries and talk about ways that they were feeling misunderstood. <clears throat> this is so brilliant, and I've tried to talk to them about this. If you recall, I think I can name Robert Phillips, who was part of our, our family here. He was one of these students, and they drew this Circle. Now, now, this is the third model here. So we can then say that our grace and our space in Christ is not a maze. It's a labyrinth. That's the first point. The second point is that if we're moving towards the center with those perceived enemies, foes, and if they are moving towards the center, we are finding unity in Christ, whether or not we understand each other. We're laying it down. Now, now the third off- offering is, now, if we started to think about ourselves as a kind of spherical entity, there's layers 
to me. There's layers to you. And just because I've been married <clears throat> to Susanna for 17 years, <laughs> we just had our anniversary. I'm on the spot. Um, just because I'm married to Susanna, she's the person I'm most intimate with on the earth, doesn't mean that I know everything about her. That's the joy and the enthusiasm of spending the rest of my life with her, is that there's still layers and layers of nuance and complexity, and she's also a growing, shifting human. So I get to constantly, regularly find out how to draw near, to behold the beauty and the wonder that is Susanna. So if we think about any one of us as the center of this, what these uh, students offered us was the experience of a black student at Hope College. I'm here at the center, right? So I use certain vocabulary about racial reconciliation, about racism, about peace. In the Christian practice, I would talk about reconciliation in one way. We share those words, but you're not me. Speaking to me, Josh, you, just because you sang in a gospel choir at Wheaton College and because you are recruiting me to be on your worship teams, you're speaking to the whole of our, our campus ministry staff. It's just like there's no way you can really understand what it's like to be a black student at Hope College. And you're using some of the same vocabulary, but you're actually several steps removed from me. You're not adjacent to me. And the way that you're presuming that you are is actually causing more damage than good. You're coming in with all these experiences. And that's great. I'm glad that you've had those experiences. That's why you're here in this conversation. But you're not as close to the center as you think you are. Can I get a witness? All right. So, so what ends up happening then is... <clears throat> If we are moving to the center of Christ and then of ourselves, we end up attaining a kind of resilience. We end up holding a kind of grace. But if we are thinking of ourselves and of God and of our neighbors as a maze, then we are going to become violent, literally, emotionally. We're going to be a continually reactive society. We're going to continue to need to respond in pain. So that's where I want to take. Those are the three ideas that I hope you can sit with here. All, that's rest, all the rest here is just some guidance through that. So... This is an invitation to the center together because how we respond to suffering reveals what we believe about God, ourselves, and each other. I love this quote. Norman Wiersba is a philosopher at Duke dealing with the question of the problem of evil. Why is there war? Why is there racism? He says, to look for a solution to these things to just try to answer that question. This becomes an excuse to avoid the communal disciplines of care and constancy that enable us together to bear, absorb, and grow through each other's hurt. That's uh, what I put in your notes there. So if I'm back here constantly trying to explain the pain in the world, going to these abstract ideas, what that does, it, it allows me to have this excuse so that I don't know how to actually be with someone in their pain. So, right from the bat, one of the gifts of the pandemic, together, always together. And I can't tell you how excited I am about our trajectory as a community, having a pastor begin next Sunday, the first official sermon, to, to learn and relearn and to keep growing how to be together, always together. And the, the difficulty is that means approaching my, my hurt, 
That means you approaching your hurt and learning how to bear each other's burdens and to learn together about difficult things. And it's okay for us to approach difficult things because we have the grace and mercy of Jesus. So let's turn to um, Matthew 11. If you have, um, instead of having you stand, um, we're going to do a little Bible work today in all of the remaining time I have. (laughs) If you have a Bible in front of you, Matthew 11, if you're new to finding books of the Bible, this would be page uh, 15. Um, 13, and we're going to go to verses 28. Uh, I lied to you. It's going to be pages 15, 14, verses 28. And so instead of standing, one of the things I do as a retreat facilitator is help folks to identify their posture. Standing can be a sign of respect and honoring God, but as we attempt to, to practice, this is a practice we call Lectio Divina, which is sacred reading, where I read the scriptures not to figure them out, but to commune, to go toward the center in Christ, to let the scripture become a part of my heart, my mind, my breath, my body. So for some of us, that means sitting in the edge of our seats to pay attention. For some of us, We want to lay back. Whatever posture helps you where you're sitting right now, really be at rest to be attentive. So I'm going to read through this really carefully and slowly and invite you as I read this to identify a word or a phrase. Just a word or a phrase, not to figure it out the way that my my partner woman who works with me, Cami, she says to notice the word or phrase that's noticing you. What really stirs your heart? So we believe that Jesus is in this place. Speak to us through the scripture, Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, for you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So as you sit with that, I invite you to write down the first reflection question there is what Or where is your war? What is your trouble? What is your battle? What is really, really messing with you? And it's okay to write it down. This is not for anybody to see. This is just for you. Take a moment and think about what's keeping you from the center in Christ. What are you overly busy with? What are you preoccupied with? What do you wake in the morning worrying about? What do you go to bed worrying about? What is taking your energy? Write that down. So in my uh, work, I'm aware that a lot of people struggle to be quiet and to pray because of trauma. There's been a lot of rediscovery about the vocabulary of trauma in the last 20 years especially. We used to only think about trauma as something that happened for veterans as they came back from war. When we think about the vocabulary of uh, racism, what has been taught to us about microaggressions, it's the idea that death by a thousand paper cuts, 
You can be traumatized. You can be severely hurt because there is just something that keeps banging away and cutting at your mind, your emotions, your body. And that can wear you down. So I wanted to just guide you through real quick. Um, Trauma is an event, whether acute or chronic, that overwhelms our capacity to draw on our resources, to process, and to respond in an empowered manner. So anything that's really keeping you from really attending to your growing health is likely aligned with some sort of trauma response. Anything that's keeping you from, we would say as people of faith, from opening your heart to the healing work and presence of God, or anything that's keeping you from opening to healing, reconciling work with people in your family, others in the body of Christ. If there is a visceral, tangible response in your body and your mind to want to move away, there's likely some traumatic pain. Here's the other... um, way to describe these responses. Trauma can cause us to self-preserve, can lead to anger outbursts. Trauma can make us become demanding and demeaning. Traumatized people can be controlling. They can have a sense of entitlement, even becoming bullying. When we look at narcissism as woken up into the conversation in our culture, when we think about what does it mean to be a leader, to be a celebrity, we're surrounded by examples of narcissism. Often those are trauma responses. Another response to trauma is flight. This can result in occupational um, obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety, panic. I can work way too much. I don't know what to do with all the pain, but I'm just going to stay busy, busy, busy. It causes us to be restless, to rush about, to be perfectionists and overachievers. Trauma can cause us to freeze. This results in a brain fog. If you have found yourself kind of feeling spacey, incapable of making decisions over the last few years, and that seems especially out of character for you, that's also potentially some trauma response. This is that indecision where you're inactive, you want to hide. This is classically a description of men to just go hide in their cave, but women have their own version of this where you just go disappear into, um, what is it, Candy Crush on your game? I don't know what to do. I'm just going to play a game on my phone. Just don't know what to do. Um, And lastly, um, a newer one that we're discovering is is that to fawn, this is where we become people pleasers. I'm feeling so much trouble. I'm going to reach out. Uh, This is where I end up flattering people. I have a a loss of myself. Remains, and then I I can stay if I'm uh, fawning in unhealthy relationships, and I'm going to struggle to have healthy boundaries. So as you read through that, I invite you to take a moment. I tabled this thinking about the human sexuality report, that that might not be your thing that's causing your trauma. You already named maybe your war, but, but does reading through that, let's just take a moment, does, it, does that help you see something else? Something else that's especially causing you panic to freeze, to become so anxious, so busy. Just to write that down. What is also, just revisiting, it's basically the same question again. What is keeping you up at night? Some of us revert into a psychology of scarcity in this way. Trauma, trauma, trauma. I'm going to overfunction to make sure I have enough of this, this, and this. If this is already 
causing you, you know, some uncomfortable pains, I invite you to take a deep breath. And I also invite you if, you, if this is especially painful, I invite you to, whether you're watching at home, feel free to turn the screen off or if you need to leave. This has got to be a safe place. If you don't feel safe right now, feel free to do whatever you'd like to do. This is also why we're going to turn to pray for each other at the end. So my final movement here is, you know, if, if I had more time, I'd, I'd, I'd thumb through the Gospel of Matthew, and I would help you understand how Matthew, out of the, four, uh, out of the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew really is an apology of who Christ is for the Jewish community. It's really a way that Matthew's working really hard through, through his vocabulary, his images, to explain to the people of Israel, Jesus is the real guy, and I want to translate Jesus into your language. <clears throat> and so it's no mistake that at the core of this journey through Matthew, we begin the, the Sermon on the Mount be, that begins then itself with the Beatitudes. If we go back to spend time in the Beatitudes, we realize, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So Jesus is really describing this posture of receptivity, of humility, of openness. So each time you keep going further from Matthew 5 through 7, all the way up to Matthew 11, it's interesting. I know Pastor Emily taught us this, this uh, section of Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, come unto me. But it's really important to understand where Jesus is sharing us, sharing this instruction with us. He's saying to us, let's go back to your center. Come to me. Come back to your core identity and rest. And it's really helpful to understand what just happened in chapter 10. So we've got the Beatitudes that have unpacked this posture of tenderness, welcoming you to understand your pain, to not have power, power ego to run over people, but allow yourself to be meek. So chapter 10 is where he's calling out the disciples. And each movement forward, Jesus is becoming more and more specific about what it means to be a follower of Christ. So if you then move on and we get to chapter 11, what's going on in chapter 11? People have come up to accuse him. It's the Pharisees, Sadducees, their normal games. Now, if we want to go back, the worst part of the Pharisees are the people who are standing on either side of the circle wanting to fight about the scriptures wanting to say, you're not a real true Jew. You're not one of us. You're a heretic. You're causing trouble. And this is so much of what we see Jesus dealing with, is all these naysayers, all these accusers. And he keeps unpacking for us what it truly means to be a Christian. And then after he deals with this argument, Jesus doesn't back away. He actually turns the fire up here. And this is some of his most prophetic. And he begins to offer us, verse 16, to what can I compare this generation? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to others. We played the flute for you. You did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came, eating and drinking, and they say, he's a glutton and drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her actions. How many times was Jesus accosted for who he was hanging out with? That's not right. We don't hang out with those people. We don't talk with them. And again, he doesn't hold back here. He goes back into the most prophetic voice here. 
Verse 20, then Jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remain to this day, but I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom than for you in the day of judgment than for you. So he's saying here, I'm going to tell you who's in and who's out. The people who are repentant, the people who have noticed what I've done, I've tried to show you. Now, What I think is happening in our version of Christianity in America is we want to jump to that prophetic posture. We want to be like Jesus and to call out, not you, not you, not you. But we haven't done the work of the Beatitudes. We have not done the work of the Sermon on the Mount. We are not in the center What we're doing when we want to argue and spar is we're actually flinging arrows and pugilism and emotional and physical violence. We're traumatizing each other because we are not in the center. If we are going to be able to call people on how to deal with these hot button issues like racism, same sex attraction, We have to do it from the center. If we don't, we will just continue to hurt and tear each other down. This is what I call a third way. Back when we talked about trauma responses originally, it used to be just fight or flight. So we just think about the other two really as other versions of fight or flight. The third way is being able to pause and to realize I've gotten to notice what, what science calls cortisol, where the amygdala, it's my fight or flight center, starts sending a, a brain chemical into my body that's called cortisol, and I start feeling it. And I could fight, I could start getting mad, I could get back on Facebook and write that thing, I could send that email, I could yell at my kids or my wife, or I could start beating up on myself, or I could just shut down and freeze and become useless, and I could fall into despair and depression, which I have a long history of. Or... I can notice that cortisol. I can feel, oh, danger's coming, pain's coming. And I can choose this third way. And I can choose, I want to be known by you. And I want to know you, healer, light of the world. I need your help right now. And in this way, The pandemic, COVID-19, has something to teach us. All of this trauma has something to teach us. So I can say that trauma heals with non-reactive surrender and trust when we have less ego to defend. If I'm spending all my time trying to prove how much control I have, if I'm spending all my time trying to prove that I'm right and my neighbor's wrong, if I'm busy trying to um, machinate, you know, shift things around to my viewpoint, then I'm defending my ego, and I'm gonna, it, that's going to be very hard. It's not that I don't want to have an ego. It's that I surrender the ego, that I open myself to the healing work of Christ. And in that way, we can then return to our center Oh Jesus Would you help us come to you? So 
So I wanna invite you just to write down if you, ha- if you have the inclination, is there a word or a phrase that you especially wanna sit with as we finish this? What is the Spirit calling to you to? Where is your surrender? What is your hope? Um, what do you sense the Spirit wants to continue talking to you about? And what do you wanna continue talking to Jesus about? What are the obstacles? We want to want more of you, Jesus, but sometimes we don't know how. We can say that we believe, but please help our unbelief. I'm gonna read this one last time. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. I uh, I didn't have a specific plan for our time in prayer together, um, but I want to share. I just want to share a couple thoughts. I don't know why exactly. Psalm twenty three has been on my mind throughout this week. But as Josh was talking, <clears throat> um, talking about being in the center. It sounded very Psalm 23-ish. It sounded like, okay, Christ has already gathered us. We're here. We're in the center. But then that other aspect of um, finding that center, but also being in the presence of your enemies. That, um, and I, I think a lot of times it's hard for me to to name who my enemy is. Um, you know, I'm supposed to love everybody, so therefore, um, how can I have enemies? But um, some enemies can be my own thinking. Some enemies can be addictions. Um, but there are many different things that... Um, that lead to to trauma, and I don't know, Josh, do you have any ideas how best we might pray together um, without necessarily revealing the traumas we wrote down? Do you have any idea of? Um, Why don't we just find a group and just pray for healing? Um, If you could find two or three, whatever you feel comfortable with right now, and just pray brief prayer like that. You don't have to name anything, but just praying that the Spirit would invite us continually into the center, past wounds, past trauma. And I I think also recognizing that, you know, we don't, we don't go into it fully understanding what that person's coming to. We're both trying to search for the center and praying for, for peace in the process. So as you feel, um, I know given COVID and all, that that may mean you don't want to get too close to anybody, but um, then just say a silent prayer towards people, extend your hand towards them, Um, but also feel free to share as well. We're just going to give some time and some space to do that now.
Lord God, you have called us here to this place, and as part of our mission, we are we are called to be centered in you, to be present in this space, not just where we're sitting, but in this neighborhood. And you've also called us towards reconciliation with so many so many isms, so many things that threaten to tear us apart. Lord, we pray that the center may hold and that you may offer your peace through your Holy Spirit. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. The... Uh, I just want to remind everybody, if, if you're carrying um, some heavy trauma and you don't feel that there's a safe space here or, um, or that you don't have a safe space outside of here, I just want to remind you that we are part of the Pine Rest's CAP program, CAPS program, and that offers um, both pastoral care and counseling. And I believe the resources for that are still in the back. Yeah. So, and if you don't see resources um, available, talk to me or any other elder or deacon, and we can point you in the right direction. Would you say a prayer of blessing? Would you stand for the benediction? We lift our hearts up to you. Where else can we go but to you? You alone have the words of eternal life. Would you go before us? Would you go behind us? Would you be to our left and our right? Would we continue to find you in the center of our hearts? We love you. We hope to be like you as we go out this week. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.